Hello, thank you for joining us and welcome to the first session of Motai Nai Reduce, Reuse, Recycle webinar. Our session today is called Edo's Eco Life for Today. I'm Hiromi Zepiri of the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership, CGP. Briefly, to give you some background, CGP was established in 1991 within the Japan Foundation and is dedicated to strengthening the global US-Japan partnership by enhancing dialogue and interchange between Japanese and US citizens on the wide range of issues, thereby improving bilateral relations. To carry out our mission, CGP supports institutions and individuals, including nonprofit organizations, universities, scholars, and educators through grant programs, fellowships, and self-initiative programs such as this one. So now, uh, jumping into the programming, everywhere we turn these days, we are hearing about or experiencing environmental problems. And you may be saying to yourself, but what can I do? Well, through this webinar series, by focusing on the spirit of Motainai, which has been a part of Japanese people's lives for centuries, we hope to reacquaint you with or reintroduce you to positive actions such as uh, each of us can take to help solve such issues and make this world a better place for ourselves and generations to come. Now, a couple of housekeeping items. We welcome your comments. Please keep it clean, friendly, and courteous. If you have any questions, please put them in the comment section. Uh, we will try to answer them during the program, and if not, we will get back to you afterward. So sit back, open your mind, and let's start the webinar. The Japanese concept of motainai has multiple meanings. By far the most commonly used form today is an expression of regret at the full value of something not being put to good use. Another form of motainai, not quite so common for non-Japanese speakers is too good for someone or something. For example, your words are too good for me. He is too good for me. I am not worthy of her. Based on my experience growing up in a Japanese speaking home, and then living in the United States for a number of years, I have observed that motaina is not easily translated into English, but we could say, what a waste, or waste not, what not. In addition, in Japan, children are told not to leave a single grain of rice in their bowls. Such wastefulness is motaina. While in the US, children are told to eat everything on their plate because there are starving children in other countries. Ms. Wangari Matai, an environmental activist from Kenya, was the first person in the environmental field awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. That was in 2004. In 2005, Ms. Matai visited Japan, where she was introduced to the concept of motainai. Impressed with the idea, she incorporated it seamlessly into her environmental philosophy. In her last interview with Motainai campaign, she stated that, quote, we have launched a global campaign to try to promote the concept of Motainai, which as you know, incorporates the three R's, reuse, reduce, and recycle, and also incorporates two very important values that I learned when I visited Japan that is respect and gratitude. These two words, respect, you could almost say like it is the fourth R, and gratitude is something we take for granted." Unquote. She mentioned there are many things we take for granted in our everyday lives, such as people who help us, as well as the safety of our food, water, and air. These are all, quote, gift of nature, and we should really be very grateful." Unquote. So there you have it, a very brief overview of the spirit and positivity of Motainai. We believe that solutions to our large problem starts from a small individual actions that can grow 
to encourage more people to open their hearts and minds and join in these constructive actions. As CGP, we want to be part of the solution. We hope you do too. Now for today's Edo's Echo Life for today's session, let me introduce you to our presenter, uh, Professor Asby Brown and our discussant, Professor Kamatani Kaoru. Welcome both of you, thank you. <laughs> well, Professor Brown is an authority of Japanese architecture, design and environmentalism and the author of many books and art articles, including The Genius of Japanese Carpentry, Small Spaces, The Japanese Dream House, The Very Small Home, and Just Enough Lessons in Living Green from traditional Japan, which I have here. This is the Japanese version, and this is the English version. Uh, Professor Brown is on the sculpture faculty at the Musashino Art University. He has been lead researcher for SafeCast, a highly successful global citizen science organization devoted to developing new technology platforms for crowdsource environmental monitoring, promoting open source and open data principles initiated by Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster in March 2011. Uh, he is a native of New Orleans and has been lived in Japan since 1985. Professor Kamatani is an associate professor in the College of Gastronomy Management at Witsumeikan University. She has a PhD in Japanese history and her current uh, research interests are the history of Edo period, culinary and fishing activities, as well as analyzing the relationship between agricultural activity and climate change. Also very important, we would like to give a special CGP thanks to our interpreter translator, Dr. Mari Morimoto. So now let's start the Professor Brown's uh, presentation. Enjoy. Hello, my name is Asby Brown and I'm speaking to you from Tokyo. I'm happy to be able to share some thinking about Motai Nai and the Edo period of Japan and what it means for us today. I'll start sharing my slides now. The title of my presentation is How Edo Shows the Way to Motai Nai Awareness. The Edo period uh, began in the early 1600s. It followed about two centuries of terrible civil wars throughout the country with a lot of environmental degradation, uh, and it ended in 1868 when the country opened to the West and uh, restored the Emperor Meiji and, and started on this new uh, path of industrialization and modernization. At the start of the Edo period, Japan was on the verge of environmental collapse uh, due to clear cutting the forest on a vast scale. This was again in connection with the wars that were being fought, building castles, needing to rebuild cities, uh, building navies, all sorts of uh, you know things they needed the lumber for, and this caused this domino effect of uh, you know bad consequences for the environment, uh, uncontrolled landslides leading to damage to the watershed, leading to uncontrolled flooding, leading to damage to agricultural productivity leading to problems with the food supply, and it was a really terrible, terrible cascading situation. Uh, but uh, due to the wisdom of the leaders and the uh, thinking and the, also the eth ethical and uh, values of the people themselves, they successfully reversed the damage and ushered in over 200 years of wise environmental resource management. Uh, by maximizing use and minimizing waste of everything that they were using on a day-to-day -day basis, the Motai Nai ethic took root. Japan was a resource poor country. Uh, it's hard to imagine now, uh, but, and the anti-waste uh, maximum youth ethic pervaded every aspect of life. This is an example of uh, sort of the values that made this possible. Uh, this is a drawing of a well-known uh, stone water basin at Ryoanji Temple in Kyoto. And the, the letters around the, the, the rim at the top, um, they all share this square character, which means mouth. And if you look at them written normally, they look like this. Uh, and it's pronounced ware tada taru shiru, which we could translate as all I need to know is enough, or I only need to know what enough is, or I'm only interested in enough, I only care about having enough. And of course, this means not just, you know, 
material goods, etc., but also sort of spiritual things like, you know, not wanting to have too much, not being too attached, etc. This was one of the value systems that uh, underpinned uh, Japan at the time and uh, shaped the culture and shaped the thinking of people and really prepared them for uh, Motainai thinking and uh, minimizing waste. I'm going to give some examples, uh, beginning with water and fuel. Now, the thing about water and fuel is um, they get combined to make hot water. Uh, and fuel was a uh, very, very prized thing because uh, the, it all came from the forest. They were using uh, wood either in the form of firewood or in the form of uh, charcoal. They were not using fossil fuels or other things, a little bit of uh, oil, etc., for lamps, but basically they were using wood and they wanted to minimize the damage to the forest, so they minimized the use of wood for fuel. And this affected how uh, hot water was used. Uh, this drawing shows a public bath, a center in the Edo period. And of course, it would be very familiar to us today I mean, if you've ever gone to a, a, an onsen in Japan. It's very, very familiar. The person on the right is entering, he's paying his admission fee, uh, and then uh, there's some lockers near the entry, and he can put his stuff in there and get a little wooden key to protect that, and goes to the, the changing room. Uh, now, of course, there is a large shared bathtub behind this ornamental red uh, archway in the back, uh, and this can hold 20 people at once, maybe more, uh, and a lot of hot water being kept, you know, warm all day long. Uh, but your admission price only qualifies you for one bucket of hot water for your own personal use. That's kind of amazing. It seems stingy, but this is because the fuel was valuable. They were going to minimize people uh, having their personal hot water uh, in this situation so they wouldn't waste the hot water. Uh, you could use all the cold water you want. The person on the left is getting some cold water for himself, uh, but hot water was limited. And uh, this is, again, a great example of avoiding the waste of fuel. And it's not like someone at the top said, we're going to make a system where no one will overuse fuel and we'll make everyone bathe at the same time. No, it sort of evolved naturally. It was economic. I mean, you could uh, bathe 200, 300 people in a day using one tenth of the amount of fuel that you would use if everyone did it at home. And again, not a lot of people had their own private baths at home. You had to be pretty well off, uh, part elite samurai or something or a wealthy merchant to do that. People basically love the public baths because they're very sociable and you know nice places. So this is a great example of motainai thinking. Uh, another one is something called gyozui, which you might translate as cat bath. And uh, it was very common to leave a big jar of water out in the sun, especially during the summer months, where it would get warmed by the sun. And by the end of the day, it wasn't hot, but it was, you know, pretty warm. So you could take a bath with that, like sit in a little bucket and splash this over yourself and get a nice sort of warm bath. In the summer, it was great. Uh, and it was no real substitute for going to the Cento, but if you're living in a, you know, farm community, maybe this was the best thing you had. Uh, also, you could use this already warm water uh, if you're going to make tea with it, then you don't need as much fuel to make the water boil. And another thing is the water itself would be conserved. I mean, um, there was a lot of fresh water, great rivers in the, throughout the country, really blessed with, with good water supply, but they didn't waste what we would call gray water. Uh, whether, you know, something from washing uh, in the sink in the kitchen or or from something like the bath like this, it would go into a pond in, in, in the farm uh, communities where it would be used for, for washing and other things, you know, other things that need water that uh, it doesn't have to be clean enough to drink. So this was also uh, an example of Motainai thinking. Uh, materials, of course, were very important and everything was used to the maximum. Uh, again, because primarily resources were scarce for a lot of things, uh, but also because it was economical. A great example is what happened to a demolished building. Uh, we, our buildings are made of generally sturdy materials. It's hard to recycle them. You know, if it's brick or concrete or stone, of course, wood buildings it can be recycled perhaps, but generally we don't do that. But in the Edo period, they recycled everything. Uh, for instance, the, the buildings of Japan are famous uh, for having a modular structure with a sort of a, 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 a dimensional module. They're, they're all built with similar dimensions, uh, you know, the same spans, the same lengths of the wood members, etc. So uh, if you're taking down the building, the, the columns and beams, the big thick timbers, those are valuable. Someone will come buy those and resell them. And they were actually lumber yards in Edo, which is again, Tokyo. Uh, uh, and all other major cities that specialize in just selling used timber. Kind of unbelievable to think. So if you're going to make a shed or something, it doesn't have to be so nice. You could save a lot of money by using this used timber. Everything else from floorboards to, um, you know, wooden thin, thin pieces of wood uh, to old bamboo, these all were valuable in some way and would get reused. Uh, roof shingles, uh, roof tiles, the ceramic tiles, 
Um, these would last 50 years at least generally, uh, and you could easily reuse those on a roof, or if they weren't in quite good enough shape, they might be used in the garden to make a decorative edging or something. Uh, they were also valuable, could be sold. Cedar shingles, they were very dry. They were great for tinder. Uh, uh, copper and met other metals were very valuable. Uh, iron was one of the scarce resources. And of course, it used a lot of fuel to make that as well. You had to use that to smelt the iron. So uh, it was kind of valuable. And uh, there were recycling merchants who would come to the neighborhood and tell the kids, uh, if you bring me some old nails, I'll give you some candy or I'll give you a toy. Uh, and of course, these are kids, you know, they've been waiting for this guy. They've been looking under bushes and, you know, finding rusty nails and keeping them and uh, knowing this guy's going to come around and he would, they would give them to the guy and get their candy or whatever. And this person would take it to the, uh, the, the, the metal smiths where it would be recycled into other uh, metal goods, tools or, or pots and pans or something. This was brilliant. Uh, social engineering as well as recycling. Uh, sliding doors, the fusuma, the shoji, also the tatami floor mats, these were all modular. They are generally a standard size. So they could generally instantly be reused in another house or another building. Uh, things like the foundation stones that the column stood on, these were had been selected because they were the right shape, uh, so those would get reused easily, could be resold, and even the clay plaster from the walls would be reused, or, you know, it would be mixed in with new plaster because uh, it actually somehow had a good quality to make a better quality plaster, or you could just crumble it up and put it into the, the ground. Uh, and the thing is that when you demolished a building in Japan in the Edo period, basically there was nothing left. Uh, you, it was dirt. You could uh, build a new building, of course, but you can also make a garden the next day. Uh, this is a remarkable thing, and I think it's a principle that we would do well uh, to try to emulate in our way of building. And of course, this all comes down to this multi knife thinking. Uh, just about everything in life was uh, refurbished for longer use. Uh, there were itinerant merchants who would go around to neighborhoods. Uh, the person on the right here is fixing uh, wooden uh, clogs, geta sandals and often the, the straps would get worn out and that's the first thing that needed to be repaired and he could do that or he could uh, resurface the, the soles you know sort of plane those off to make them flat again if they got worn down very very common to have your your wooden uh, get to sandals uh, refurbished uh, many times before you get ready to uh, get rid of them uh, the person on the left is refurbishing tobacco pipes it's called kiseru they had this long sort of a, a reed tube that was used that would get clogged or would get broken so he could fix those things too. Uh, and uh, things like uh, materials such as rice straw are sort of a remarkable uh, example of full utilization of resources. Um, basically rice, it's food and it's grown to make white rice, uh, you know, which is of course the most valuable rice at the time uh, and could be used to pay your taxes, et cetera, as well. Uh, people would eat brown rice, but basically, basically white rice was more valuable. Um, so in the process of making the rice, uh, the first thing is when you when you strip it off of the, the stalk, um, it has a hull. It's called a momi and a momigara. And uh, you could then just send this to the, the, the field, to the, the garden as compost or fertilizer, or you could also burn it if you need to uh, for as part of your fuel supply. But it was useful for other things uh, as an abrasive to make scrubbers, uh, to make uh, weights or to make pillows, to fill pillows with this stuff. And in fact, this is still done today. So momigara was used. And then when this pillow or scrubbers or whatever are there worn out, then it becomes compost or fuel. It's going back to the agriculture supply or part of your fuel supply uh, and maybe reused after that when it's ash. Uh, then you're left with brown rice, uh, which has uh, the, the, the brand, which is called nuka. And this is also useful. I mean, they, it's uh, even used today when you make pickles. Uh, and it could be used for certain skin care and other things like that. Uh, and eventually this would also become compost or fertilizer as well. Um, but the remarkable thing, of course, is the rice straw itself. Uh, again, this is a byproduct. You're growing your rice because it's a food, but the rice straw is really useful. And in fact, people made everything you can think of from that, from uh, footwear, you know, Zori sandals to hats, aprons, you know, floor mats, bags, rope, uh, brushes, roofing thatch, uh, you name it, they made this. And of course, these were often handcrafts done at home, uh, especially in the farming communities. And they were generally going to last about one season. These were not that durable necessarily, but when they're done, then you could compost them or for use them for fertilizer, uh, mulch or something like that, or you could burn them for fuel. And the interesting thing about the rice straw is that it was high in potassium. And the ash that resulted was very, very useful for things like dye making or for metal production or for ceramics or for making abrasives. And people would come, there would be merchants who would come around 
and buy your ash. So you would save this stuff up and sell it. It's kind of remarkable to us today. We would try to get rid of this. It's, just, it's a nuisance, but all this stuff had further uses. Uh, it was multi night just to throw it away. Uh, someone's going to use it. Someone's going to sell it. It's going to be uh, made into some other kind of useful product. Um, there was lots of redistribution with recycling and other kinds of redistribution. There were over 500 used clothing sellers in Edo. Uh, kind of unbelievable to us today. There was nothing embarrassing about uh, wearing an old kimono for most people. Uh, in fact, you just get tired of your current one. You'd bring it to this uh, used clothing seller. And they were some in shops, but generally they were also itinerant. They would walk around. their peddlers are going to neighborhoods. Uh, and uh, you would give them your old kimono, and they would uh, either just buy it from you outright, or they would give you a discount on choosing something from his selection that you like. And there were also fashions, which were, you know, sort of patchwork of, of, of other kimono designs. There was nothing embarrassing about this at all. Um, everything else was recycled, redistributed somehow. Uh, the guy on the left is uh, gathering old broken pottery. And this could be either repaired or, or put to other uses. The person on the right is fixing uh, uh, paper lanterns. Uh, very easy to recover those and you know just the hard part is making the sort of frame the paper covering is easy they just refurbish that the same thing for umbrellas so very easy to do that so all these things were done and, and it was over like a thousand recycling businesses in edo during this period hard to imagine we I don't even have that many probably today in tokyo so I guess to conclude, I want to point out that the Edo period multi nai environmental resource and design principles were so effective that Edo can serve as a prototype and inspiration for us today for truly sustainable living and teaching us the many benefits of living in a highly developed circular economy where things are not all ending up in landfill or being uh, incinerated, but are coming back in to become new products, endlessly being recycled, recycled, uh, upcycled, uh, and finding ways to be reused. Uh, and this is, you know, a great lesson for us. We know it's possible. It shows us that it's possible. Uh, we don't necessarily want to use the same technologies or have the same designs for what we do, but the thinking is something we can really benefit by uh, adapting ourselves. A lot of what I've talked about is in my book, Just Enough, uh, which emerged over 10 years ago in 2010, uh, and a new edition will be released by Stonebridge Press early next year. I encourage you all to uh, find it and read it, and uh, hopefully there'll be something inspirational for you as well. Uh, thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation, uh, and I look forward to the rest of the program. Okay, so welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the video. And thank you, Professor Brown, for the fascinating presentation. That was so interesting, and I loved your hand drawing art. And of course, it's in the book too. <laughs> and it was both beautiful and explanatory, and we learned so much from it. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> so now let's give the floor to Professor Kamatani, the discussant, please. Hi. Brown 先生, to the more Kyomi Bukayo Hanashio, Arigato Bozaimashita. と、すごい素敵なイラストが印象に残りました。あの、江戸時代の良いところがいっぱい詰まった内容でとても勉強になりました。お話の中であの、特にタルオシルという言葉をご紹介されておりましたけれども、私もそれはあの、大好きな言
だいぶ昔の時代があの今こういったまあ現代社会の中でこう評価されてもったいないというまあ言葉の中であの伝えるべきことを表している場所地域だっていうことで再注目されているということについてあの日本人としても嬉しいですし日本の歴史学者としてもとても嬉しく思いましたブラウン先生がこういったことに着目をされた時にハッと一番最初にこうもったいないっていう言葉でこの社会をあの見た時に一番こう今日お話しいただいたことも含めての中で一番衝撃を受けたのはどういうことだったのかなっていうのを教えていただきたいなっていうようなことを思いましたありがとうございます。あ、uh, Thank you very much、uh, for your, your kind comments. It's ほめごろし<笑> expression that means you know、uh, compliments enough to kill a person、um, but I really appreciate your comments and, and because you're, you're a specialist yourself and you're also、uh, paying close attention to this and、uh, from my point of view my purpose was to communicate、uh, to non-Japanese and I assumed from the beginning that most Japanese people knew all about it already Because I had had many conversations.、Uh, people I met would talk about Edo period, recycling, some aspects of environment. So I thought most Japanese people knew a lot about it.、Uh, and I was very surprised that, in fact, that wasn't the case. So I was glad to be able to make a Japanese edition. If I think about what I learned about how things were done、uh, during the Edo period,、uh, there w a s just surprises everywhere. But The biggest surprise was how complete the system was. In other words, this kind of thinking pervaded every aspect of society, every、uh, rank of society,、uh, every region, and it continued for a long time.、Uh, and I, I think for me, the, the key to my understanding was learning that things were connected, that how the forests were being managed. Was very connected to the watershed, to rivers, to the water problem.、Uh, the watershed, the water issues were connected to the agriculture.、Um, the agriculture was, of course, connected to other resources,、uh, productivity, population,、uh, waste,、uh, and what do they do with the waste. So, to understand that this was all connected, and, and somehow, although the society was not scientific in the way that we think of Western science, There was a very good understanding of how these things are connected.、Uh, and that's what I tried to, to bring across in the book and in, in、uh, my other thinking about this. そうですね、あの今あのおっしゃっていただいたように、そのすべてのことがこうつながっていて、でそれをこ,こ,ここがこうなれば、ここがこうなるといったような形に、こうその一つの部分、例えば農業が良ければいい。漁業が良ければいい林業が良ければいいっていうわけではなくてこう全てのことがつながるような形でその持続可能な社会が作られていたっていうところをあの評価していただいたのかなというふうにあの受け取りました。でえっと、そのことについてはやはやりあのこう私たちあの,私のような江戸時代をあの研究してきた人間からしてみればそ,のそれが特にそのまあ、素晴らしいことというより、まあ、江戸時代のあり方としてこう連綿とこう社会が続いていくための、まあ、当然の流れだと思っていたんですがそれをこうサスティナブルな社会だっていう形で再評価できるっていうことはやはりこう今の,その世界やまあ日本が置かれている状況っていうものとすごく関わって来るのかなと思いますあの現代社会が置かれている状況がその何をどんなヒントを必要なのかっていうことがあの常に社会には課題があってそれをこう昔の時代に、まあ、目が向けられたそういう理由だっていうふうに思います。でそう考えた時にその、えっと、日本人自体よりもあの世界の中でそういうふうに思って
てあの注目してもらえるっていうことは素晴らしいと思いますがもしかしたら日本,人日本人はそんなに思っていないのかもしれないんですが例えば私がこれから江戸時代を研究していく上でそういったことを日本の人たちにどうやってアピールしたらいいのかなっていうようなことを思うんですが先生はいかが思,います思われますか、uh, that's a tough question. And, and actually... This is one of the questions that is asked the most often. What can we do now? What can we learn? What are the lessons we can learn?、Uh, and I believe that, well, it's not about changing back to Edo period technology or social structure or economy or any of that necessarily. It's about the way of thinking and the way of understanding the problems. And again, I believe this has to come through understanding how things are connected.、Uh, one thing that I really feel very strongly from you know, reading about and learning about people of the Edo period, and I also felt this when I was researching with uh, uh, Nishioka Tsunekazu, the Miyadaiku,、uh, was the sense of time and responsibility both to the future and to the past. That we are here, what we do now is, is going to be preparing the, the, the conditions for the people who come after us. And I felt in the case of Edo,、uh, it, it was not necessarily, they didn't believe it was endless, but they really believed that this would continue. The purpose, we, we use the word junkan or, 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 or circular or, or sustainable, but they really believed that it, they needed to find a way to let it continue indefinitely.、Uh, With as much benefit for as many people as possible. So, this is a value.、Uh, and our current economic thinking, our political thinking is so short range. Really, a few years, a, a businesses, they're thinking of the next quarter. So, this sense of think about the next generations, think about 100 years in the future, think about 500 years in the future. And in order to understand that, you need to know what happened 100 years before, 200 years before, 500 years before. So, this, if there was some way to help people grasp this、uh, way of thinking, that would be for me the best thing. And there's also some, I would say, strange things or things that may be contradictory.、Um, I mean, overall, I think the Japanese society of the time was, let's say, trying to minimize overconsumption. It was using things very carefully. It was not. Focused overall on gathering wealth and making money. It was more about many people having a better quality of life. And I think the governance of the period,、uh, we know,、uh, I think Tanaka Yuko sensei has written about Kumazawa Banzan and, and his thinking that, oh, yeah, the, the, this Confucian thinking, again, the responsibility was to help everybody. And I think many of the leaders of the time、uh, really believed that. But at the same time, we have this highly Consumer fashion oriented merchant class,、uh, which, you know, if they could, they would have as much as they could and they would flaunt their wealth and they would probably be a little more wasteful. And we know some of them were.、Uh, so there was this tension between this desire to be wealthy, to gain status by consumption. But even then, I think the households like of, of wealthy merchants or even of daimyo. Uh, they may be showing off a lot of wealth, but basically they were running the household in a very frugal, minimal waste way. And so this is a strange contradiction, I think,、uh, that, that I'm not really sure I understand. Maybe Kamatani sensei, maybe you, you have thought about this, or do you have any ideas about that? So, this is, yeah, I think, 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 があの学ばなければいけないことは技術そのもの江戸時代の技術そのものではなくてその当時の人たちの価値観だと思うんですねなのでまあ、全く先生のお考えに私も賛成ですでそして、えー、もう一つ後半のお話ですけれどもそのあのいみんながこうみんなでこう
より良い暮らしをっていう中でその商人たちがこう贅沢な暮らしをしてたっていうところもありますがしかし一方でその富を蓄えた人たちも悪い人たちばっかりではなくてですねやっぱりその人たちは例えば災害が起こった時とかにあの自らの資材で、えーまあ、あの災害を被害者の人たちのまあ働き口を作ったりしてお金をまああの富をこう分,か分かつことであの得を得るというかそういうような考え方っていうのも一方ありましたまたあのその一方であのそういうふうなことをしないと結構押しあの客商たちに押し込みをあの襲われたりとかですねそういうようなこともあったりするので、まあ、あの意図的にそういうふうにしなければいけなかったっていうところもありましたただあの日本人の,その特に江戸時代も後半になってくるとなかなか武士の財力というのが不安定になってきますので、まあ、そういった中でさまざ、あ、まな商人たちがいましたけれどもあの実質江戸時代の、まあ、富を支えたのはそういった商人たちの頑張りだったのかなというところがありますので、まあ、そういうところでは一方で評価をすべきなのかなっていうようなことも思います。うん、面白いですね。I'm sorry, it's very interesting.、Um, very interesting. And you know, you mentioned the the changing condition of the samurai towards the end of the Edo period, and this is to me also fascinating. That here is the very pyramidal pyramid society with the samurai at the top, and I think some of our audience know、uh, the next were the farmers, next higher in status, not necessarily wealth, and then the merchants, or the, the craftspeople, and then the merchants were the lowest, but they managed to get most of the money. And, and the samurai, especially the middle or the lower ones, were really having a hard time economically because their income was fixed based on what their grandfather got, perhaps. So you asked before what sort of things were very surprising to me. When I learned that most, many, if not most, samurai households in Edo ended up growing their own food. They had their own、uh, small farm plots on their property in the city. And, and if you look at this, a very big city,、um, 500,000 samurai households or so, and most of them are growing food, this is a massive scale of urban farming. I think unprecedented. Uh, until then, and, and maybe even since then, maybe only at the wartime in some places, maybe like uh, uh, England and other places.、Uh, and the other thing that surprised me, and it was one of those, ah,、oh, now I get it moments, was、um, when I realized or learned that because samurai were prohibited from doing business, they couldn't sell their vegetables, they couldn't sell the food they grew, but they could distribute it. What we call suso wake. So just give it to their friends and give it to their relatives. And of course, their relatives were doing the same thing. So this family has too many eggplant. And so they give it to everybody they know. And then the other family has too many you know, pumpkins. And then that comes everybody. And this is, this is a gift economy. This is a gift economy and also a kind of circularity.、Uh, and this was amazing because the samurai couldn't have money or were not supposed to have money. But they were dealing with this on this gift economy. So you had three economies layered on each other. You had、uh, the rice economy, which all these farmers are growing rice, and that's going for their taxes. So that's basically what the country is running on the, the, the value of rice.、Uh, and then、uh, the, the merchants are using money,、uh, and farmers were, were discouraged from using money, but eventually more and more they did. Uh, and then the samurai were doing this gift economy, all three working at the same time. I don't know if there's any other example of this in history anywhere in the world, and it worked very well for a long time.、Uh, maybe the osowake came from susowake? Yes. Yeah, yeah.、Uh, susowake, yeah. yeah. I think so. And, and it, this isn't, I think this is a common thing in, in all regions, in farm, farm villages or in other neighborhoods. But I think for the samurai, it became essential to make sure they had enough of a variety of food if they couldn't pay for it with money. I would love to have those neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think, Kamatami san? そうですね本当にあのおっしゃられるように、あの江戸時代の,その武士の,あの武士に限らず、そのまあ贈答文化っていうのはすごくあの
なんていうか活発だったんじゃないかなっていうふうに思います。で特にその江戸時代の例えばあの徳川幕府の公式記録の徳川時期とかを見ていると冬の季節になったらたくさんみかんがあのこう贈答品として入ってくるとかですねそれからあのお寺の記録とかを見ていてもものすごくそのいろんなものがあの贈答品が送られてきたということが書いてあります。そしてあの江戸時代の時代の国士館であのいろいろなものを贈答品として渡す例えばあの、えっと、お肉をあの塩漬けにしたようなお肉とかそれからあの鶴とかやっぱりめでたいものとか性のつくものっていう風なものをあの送り合ったりするっていう文化っていうのがあってあとなんかそういうようなことを見ているとあのすごく華やかなんですけれどもその一方でその武士同士でお祝いとかでお渡したりするものもあの中古品を買ったりとかして渡したりとかあのもらったものもすぐ売ってあのそれをあのなんていうかリユースするっていうようなことをやっていてなかなか節約しながらあの物を送ったりしてたんだなっていうふうなことが分かります。あのちなみにあの江戸時代の中頃からあるあの日本のことわざで「あの武士は食わねど高ようじ」という、えー、ことわざがあります。これは武士は食べていないんだけれどもあの、まあ、用事っていうのはあの歯ブラシのようなものですね食べていないけれども満腹になったふりをしてその用事をこうするっていうそういうあのことわざがありますでこれはきっとその、まあ、武士は下級の武士であったとしても、まあ、プライドとしてはお腹を空いているっていうふうなことは見せれないっていうような、まあ、ただそういうようなことがあのことわざとして流行ったのはあの当時まあ、あの武士を少しこうバカにする、まあ、商人たちとか町の人たちというか、まあ、そういうようなこともあったのかななんていうようなことを思ったりします。Very interesting. Yeah, I, I really think、uh, it's fascinating when we think of, you know, when we learn more about the reality of, of, of life and what people are actually doing to get by and, and the situation of samurai. And it, you know, to continue on this, one thing that struck me. Was the importance of education、uh, and the importance of literacy and reading and publishing. And when I was learning about、uh, how the bushi, how the samurai were doing their farming, well, I know that there were lots of manuals, books about farming to tell you how to grow things, how to grow the best pumpkins, how to grow the best everything. And, and that bushi were, were educated people. They approached Farming as, as educated people,、uh, even a little bit scientifically and also competitively. I know there was a lot of competition. My, you know, Kawacha are better than yours. And、uh, there was an interesting thing I learned.、Uh, I spent a lot of time in Kanazawa.、Uh, so that was the Kaga、uh, domain. And are you familiar with something called the Kaga Kebari for fishing? Kaga Kebari.、Mm -hmm. These are fish hooks. Uh, which are still made today, and they're beautiful.、Uh, they're, the hook is often has gold leaf, and they're made to look like an insect, and the head is made of lacquer with gold and beautiful feathers and silk, silk threads to make it look like insects. This culture emerged during the Edo period because the Kaga Han, the Kaga domain, told all of its samurai from now on. You can't buy fish, you have to catch your own fish. So you just imagine all these samurai saying, okay. And they're becoming beautiful artisans to make the most beautiful fish hook, and they're all out there in the river, you know, <laughs> doing their fishing with these beautiful fish hooks. And these still exist today.、Uh, at, at, during the 20th century, it was always done by men, but during the 20th century, during the war, women started to do it, and they're still being made in Kanazawa now、uh, by a few places. So this, the samurai attitude that You know, catching your own fish or growing your own food, this is not demeaning. This doesn't make you a low person.、Uh, this is also something you can be proud of. And if you approach it, you know, with your, with your education. Let me ask one quick question to the both professors、um, at this point.、Uh, what is your definition of Motainai? And how does your knowledge of the Edo philosophy? Philosophy and mentality of Motaina impact your everyday life since we learn so much about Edo life right now.、Hmm. Um, it's interesting because when I first came to Japan, I did a homestay with a family in Tokyo. 
And uh, I remember that the mother uh, kept all of the wrapping paper after she went shopping. She would flatten out the paper and fold it and kept it under the sink. And I thought, eh, you know, why, why bother? I'm American, right? Why bother? Just throw it away, you know? And I said, why do you keep that? And she said, oh, and I think she actually used the word motainai. This, because I can use it for many things. To throw it away would be motainai. My and grandmother I, used to do that too. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yes. But I would just hear this expression, motainai, motainai. It's a waste. It's a waste. It's a waste. Don't waste. Don't waste. Don't waste. And, and um, I heard this in common use before it became popularized. Uh, you know, uh, later as a kind of a general principle by like Wangari, uh, Matai-san, etc. Um, for me, you know, it's connected with, uh, again, the sense of respect and responsibility uh, and appreciation. And and as I, you know, mentioned in, in my presentation, uh, you know, a little bit, talking about the, the Taru Oshiru, you know, these were ethical values that the human being is not the most important thing that we really are part of something bigger and we need to do the best we can to to help every living thing to help every person to help everything and part of that is not taking too much so this this attitude is just pervasive the 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 interesting thing to me is that it still exists it's still very common we find it every day somewhere at the same time with this similar contradiction that we see tremendous waste in contemporary Japan as well. So um, I think for me, motainai is simply personally, uh, because I like to make things, you know, I'm making sculpture or, or making designs or, or making furniture. And I'm always finding things like a old broken piece of wood, you know, <laughs> and thinking, huh, I can use this for something. <laughs> you know, it'll be a waste to throw this away. This is actually from a, a window frame. It's made of oak. and. I think, oh yeah, I can use that for something. That would be useful for something. I can reuse that somehow. And I sort of have that just inner uh, compulsion to, to think that way and to find those things. So uh, for me, motainai means, ah, there's another use. I can find a way to reuse that thing that everyone else thinks is just worthless.言葉を聞いたときにやっぱりもったいないっていう言葉を聞いたときにやっぱりもったいないっていうのが何が一番こうもったいないことだなっていうふうに思うかっていうとあの深く理解する前に諦めてしまうことっていうのが一番もったいない
。で、江戸時代の人々はそうやって、まあ、いろいろなものと向き合ってきたと思うんです。で、そういうような江戸時代の暮らし方っていうのは、あの、ものを大切にすることの大切さとか、手に入れたものを長く使うとか、工夫して使うとか、人とかものとかを、そのじっくり向き合ったりあといらなくなったものを誰かとシェアをするとかたくさんの教えを今の私たちにこう伝えてくれているんじゃないかなっていうふうに思います。Uh, I really like that.、Um, and I, I, I feel a lot the same way.、Um, it gives us an opportunity to think, to, to reflect on what's important.、Uh, Where things come from,、uh, where they're going. I mean, everything around us has a story. You know, if it's my computer or my chair, the things it's made of came from somewhere. Somebody made it, you know, somebody brought it.、Uh, we're using it.、Uh, and all of these things are, I think, we should pay attention to. Where did it come from? Where is it going? And what does it mean to, to me?、Uh, and that includes. Do I need it? Can I do without it?、Uh, and, and we're always seeking, looking for things that are really meaningful for us. And this is this is this human drive. You know, we know about Maslow's you know,、uh, pyramid of, of, of human, you know, <laughs> human life. But、um, we need meaning. And、uh, we're surrounded by things that are not important, which are easy to throw away.、Uh, and what we want to find are things that. We want to keep, want to pass down to the next generation, to other people.、Uh, and those, these could be things, they could be ideas, they could be places, they could be environments,、uh, they could be a lot of things. So I, I, really, I really agree. It's about、uh, taking a minute to, to think about you know, who we are. Thank you very much, both of you.、Uh, I think we have、uh, one last question from our audience, actually. So the question is Where do you feel is the line between motainai and hoarding and cluttering? And that's a big question, I think. But、um, if you would start,、uh, Professor Brown. That's a good question. And as I was a moment ago showing this piece of broken wood,、uh, <laughs> believe me, my wife thinks it's junk and it's cluttering <laughs> up my room. And One reason I have the camera blurred now is this is my workroom at home and it's full of things that I have saved to reuse.、Um, there's a total difference. It's, it's not simply, I think the instinct to clutter or to hoard comes from a fear of not having enough stuff. I need it. Ah,、uh, I don't want to lose this. You know, that's different from finding something that has a particular. Beauty or interest, and thinking, ah, this deserves a longer life, and I'm going to find a way to do that.、Uh, I think it's very, very different.、Uh, so I guess that's as much as I could explain about that. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Eh, s e n o a no, Hana, to the more. Oh, Mosiro, it is me. What does she more, a no. たくさんの捨てれないものがあって、今日は青いシートで隠しています。<笑>あの私が考えるもったいないと、それからまあ溜め込むっていうのの境界線ですけれども、まあ、もったいないっていうのはやはりその自らの意思で、あのこれを捨てるべきじゃないっていう意思が強く働いているっていう一方で、まあ、溜め込むというのは、まあもったいないっていうことよりも、無意識に気がつけば<笑>、溜め込んでしまっているっていうようなところがあると思うのですね。なので、あの、多分、もったいないと溜め込むの境界線は、誰から見てももったいないっていう,いうことだけじゃなくて、自分がやっぱりもったいないと思ってるかっていうことだと思うんですが、やはり、自分以外の人が誰から見てもこれは溜め込んでいるだろうっていうものは自分がもったいないって思っていてもそうじゃないのかなっていう気持ちもしますただもったいないっていう言葉は日本ではあのケチだとかあの節約とかとは少し違うニュアンスも持っているんじゃないかなっていうふうに思っていますもったいないっていうことを言う人についてあの
それを人が聞いた時にあの人ケチだなっていうようなことは思いませんもったいないって聞いた時にあそうだな自分もそういう心がけをしてもうちょっと大切にこれ捨てようと思ってたけどもうちょっと使おうかなとかそういうふうなことを気づかしてもらう素敵な言葉だというふうに思っています。That was the fabulous, actually.、Um, I still remember one person told me that、uh, what is the difference between Mottai Nai and Kechi being cheap? And that person actually said Mottai Nai has a love. Mottai Nai is something that you think about other people、mm. and other things, but Kechi being cheap is selfish. And、mm. that person actually said that is the biggest、uh, difference that she thinks. And that's a Shinju Mariko san, Motai Naiba san. Yeah. Yes. I And, think it's true. Yeah. So、uh, our time is just about up. And so let me thank Professor Brown and Professor Kamatani for an interesting and eye opening session. And Dr. Morimoto for interpreting today. Thank you. So, to all of you out there, we hope you have enjoyed this opening session on the history of. And spirit of Motai Nai, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And you have been inspired to think about positive actions that you can、uh, personally take lessons our from footprint on the environment. And、uh, please stay tuned.、Uh, we will have more sessions related to this diverse topics in the coming weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you all. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.